talked to my designer for Miss Fury, and she, it's her birthday. And I just sent her oh, files, yeah. and I didn't wish her a happy birthday. Oh. You got to do that. You got to say happy birthday, by the way. Here's the files. What's up, everybody? Okay. This is the Uncanny Omar. And today <laughs> I am joined by this gentleman right here, Teen Sensation, <laughs> Billy Tucci. <laughs> teen, sensation. teen Sensation. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, pal. Good to see you. Good to Very see good you. Thank you so much for having me on today. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and thank you to Vincent Faust for putting this together uh, over yep. at Dynamite. Uh, yeah. because uh, teen sensation Billy Tushi is currently working on a book over there, which we'll get to here in a little bit. Now, I've met you at uh, several conventions over the past, oh my goodness, a uh, couple of decades. And so you've, you've always been a blast to talk to. I was, uh, back when I was in the single editions game, I, I used to have, you know, the first appearance of She. Um, oh, thank you. All the, you know, all the stuff that you did over at uh, the Crusade Comics, which that was all you, right? Yeah. Like that's what you helped start was and everything. Me. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that and what you, how that all came about, and what you're working on recently? We'll talk a little bit about your uh, yourself. Sure, thanks. And first of all, thank you for having me, Omar. Um, for those of you out there who don't know me, my name is Billy Tucci. I am a 26 year vet of the comics industry. Uh huh. Uh, I. Tried to get into comics two years before that, so uh, if I was a better artist, I guess, I would have been a 28-year vet, veteran of the comics industry, but no one would hire me. They felt my style, that they that, that it didn't match the existing styles, and uh, I went to, you know, I, I went to comic conventions, showed my portfolio to everyone. I graduated right. from illustration from, I graduated from the fashion, New York City's Fashion Institute of Technology with a bachelor's in illustration degree and I love comics and I want to draw comics and um but you know I was turned down by everyone everyone but Brian Brian Polito actually at San Diego Comic-Con 1993 offered me a pinup and that ended up being hey, my she pinup in the lady death swimsuit issue the year later uh two years later but uh so that's my first work in comics but um yeah so I went and I, I was you know rejected by several by everyone everyone rejected me and then finally, I said, you know, the hell with them and do my own comic. I had no idea how to do a comic, let alone a full color comic. I had no idea how they were made. I had no idea how they were printed. I had no idea how, the, how they were, the, how they were colored or separated and all this. And basically, I just went to the library and started uh, doing my research and going to comic shops, you know, and and asking them where they got their comics from, where I learned about previews and all that. And mm -hmm. I had this story that I had been thinking of since college. And the character actually started off as a male character. I was told okay. by many people, um, well, you know that they because I, I went to other smaller publishers to see if they would they would do they would take my new creator own book. And and I was told that you know girl books don't sell, um, you know things like that. You should change it to a male character. And I'm like, no, it, the story is better with a female. Now this is before you have to think at this time Wonder Woman didn't even have her own comic book. What year is this? When this you were trying 93 to when I was doing this. Okay, so '93, probably around the same time, uh, Image had been around for yep. about a year and yep. a half. Dark Horse was still kind of, you know, Dark Horse had been around, but not a lot of indie publishers, especially yeah, no. people that uh, would publish their own books. Right, and, and so uh, basically, I said, you know, the hell with this, I'll do it myself, and I did it myself. And and uh, she, the way of the warrior, number one hit in March of 1994. We had initial orders of uh, 37,000 copies. My wife, uh, who was my college girlfriend from college at the time, she was a marketing person. She typed up a letter saying she was the uh, marketing director of this new company, Crusade Comics. And, I, you know, I was just doing it out of my one-bedroom apartment in Queens. And Nobody needed to know that, though, yeah, right? No like that. Crusade and, Comics? Yeah, yeah. And I had no money. I was six months behind my rent. It was, a, it was a rough, rough time, but there was just something special about this book. I just knew this book, even though everyone told me it wouldn't, would do well. And son of a bitch, if that book didn't hit, within three weeks of it hitting, we had reorders for over 140,000 copies. 140,000 yeah, of issue only, one? Yeah, and it probably could have got reorders of 200,000. There was only 50,000 copies made. So that helped I, fuel it. And another thing I did is that I knew this book was going to was gonna do well. So what I did is I waited. I didn't want any retailers to be able to order or fans be able to order issue two until issue one was on the stands. So mm -hmm. I solicited issue two three months later. 
And the reorders and, and the issue number two orders were like 80,000. They were even higher. And it just kept going up and up from there. And uh, we did over 100 issues, did it for about a decade, sold over three and a half million comics. And uh, it was I mean, it was a hell of a ride. And then I got a little burnt out. I got to be honest with you, doing the same character. And, you know, my ADHD and everything. I'm like, oh, no, I want to, you know, and, and talking to my friends, say, why don't you come over to us? Why don't you do this? Do, you know, do a mainstream book. I'm like, yeah, yeah I'll do that. Let me do that for a year or two. And that was like, and that was like 15 years. Uh, so now I'm like, no way. I'm doing my own books. Doing my I, re books. I remember before that first day, I was working at a comic book store in 1992, 1993. Mm -hmm. uh, best job I've ever had. Best job. Ever. And, and, and I remember how I had a copy of that razor annual number one. Right, which is technically her first appearance. She's first appearance, yes. yep. right? Yep. And then they, there was uh, there was a solicit for the book, and the guy that owned the shop was like, "I don't know about this," and I'm, and I was like, "Look, it's an independent title, and it's a female lead. Image is doing really well, and at the time they were, at the time most publishers were doing well, right? This is before the comics implosion, yeah, and." So I made him order some copies just on a whim. Keep in mind, this is a small town in Kentucky. And we got about 20 copies, and they were pre-sold out. Like, people were like, have you seen this picture? It was just based on that picture that you had of oh, the really? character. <laughs> yeah, that that appeared, like, in – I don't remember where it was. Maybe it was Previews yeah. World or something, right? And people were like, I want this comic because Lady Death had blown up, you know. Yeah, and they were like, this yeah, is going to be the yeah. – and everybody was like, this is going to be the next Lady Death. And sure enough, man. Like, yeah, and I didn't even know. And, and Brian, it's so funny because you know I knew that Brian, Brian was like was nice to me, and I knew about er Evil Ernie from him. But mm -hmm. I was, you know, when you start doing your own book, you're not really looking at the other book. So I didn't know that Lady Death was coming out two months before. And thank God, because Lady Death is success of Lady Death. I guess people didn't want to miss out on the next one, say, and that was she. And then a week after she came out, Vampirella number one, Vengeance of Vampirella number one came out uh, by yeah. by Buzz. And um, oh, it, it just it just exploded, dude. It was crazy. Well, and then back then, though, I don't know how many people that are watching or will watch this later. Back then, things were a little bit different. Back then, it was like everybody thought we were going to get rich by buying every number one issue, <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know how it was from your end, but on my end as the consumer, every image title, yeah. Brigade, uh, Team Youngblood, <laughs> Wildcat Zero, like these things that nowadays, you know, people would be like, ah, I don't know about this book. Back then, every number one sold up until, you know, about a year or so later when people were trying to sell those comics back to the comic shop. And the comic shop was like, I'll give you 10 cents maybe for that book that you paid. But sometimes it would pay off, such as the case of uh, she, right? She number yeah, one. I remember yeah, I guess, that. I guess because there wasn't so many of them. And then when they hit, they just they were gone. People bought them. You know, like they, they weren't, they didn't linger around. There, there never was really she's, because you got to think when she came out in 94, that was kind of the end. I mean, we had the number three book in 1995, uh, say July 1995. We had the number mm -hmm. three book, and I think our sales were 190,000 copies only. So That's it crazy. wasn't like a million, like like a lot of the image books. And I did the same thing. I have, you know, from, from even going back further to that, to uh, Uncanny X-Men number one. You know, I have three issues of that, you know, of each issue. I have Jim Lee. Uh, Jim Lee? Yeah, Jim Lee's. Oh, I you're have, a smart man. <laughs> yeah, same, same thing with, uh, with all the image titles, too. You know, Wildcats and stuff. I'm like, I'll buy two of them. Why not? Mm -hmm. They were dollar, I don't know, whatever they were, dollar ninety five or something. Yeah, I'll take two of those. Why not? I still have them. I'm going to have to, I'm going to do a dig uh, and, and just go through all and, my. And have, <laughs> and I had a friend that. of mine that still kept all his, right? Like all his image titles. And he was like, Omar, can you please uh, come over here and tell me what's worth anything? And I was like, man, you know, I'm going to end up breaking your heart, right? Like maybe, maybe a couple of these. Yeah. Uh, so what, what were you into? What got you in the comics? Like you couldn't just been a guy that had never picked up a comic book and said, I want to do this for a living, yeah. right? You had to have been a fan first. Yeah. I was a huge fan. No, I was a huge fan. Believe it or not. I played hockey my whole life. So uh, I've been playing hockey okay. since I was like seven years old. So I had hockey and comics. That's what I loved, you know, going to the, going to the rink and, you know, reading my comics that we had gotten. Um, I real I was into comics and, you know, junior high, elementary school into junior high. But the weird thing was, is that I loved comics so much and I knew I wanted to be an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I knew I, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to write and draw or be a novelist or something. I, I think I'm a much better writer than an artist. Um, 
So that was my real love was was to 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 do that. But the here's the thing, and I wanted to write comics. I wanted to draw Ant Man and write Ant Man. I had stories for that. I had stories for Daredevil, which I still have. Um, the then in high school, junior high, the okay. better I got at art, you know, I started to become good. The more intim- the more it drew me away from comics because I'm looking at John Romita and Dave Stevens had come out then with the Rocketeer. Um, John yeah. Romita, Joe Kuber, you know, George Perez, you know, these amazing, amazing artists. And I'm like, I could never do that. I'm, I could never be this good. And that really took me out of comics all the way uh, from high, from junior high into, um, in, into, into college, into like my 1988. So I remember an illustration class. Now comics still really weren't that cool to be. I love Matt Wagner's Grendel, the Christina Spar story. That kind of what got me back into comics was that. Because okay. my professor came to me and said, you should draw comics. And I'm like, I love comics, but I'm not good at – I can't you, draw Wait, you, you had a professor say that to you? Oh, yeah. She's like, Karen Santry, my professor said, you should be doing this. You That's should awesome. Be really. So I remember, though, thinking, though, from comics from my childhood, and I like mm-hmm. the Pander Brothers style. But then it wasn't until 1988 when my buddy brought in the Amazing Spider-Man – uh, what is it? Number uh, uh, 300? No, yeah. Amazing Spider-Man number 300. Venom. The 25th anniversary Todd McFarlane issue. Mm-hmm. And I remember looking at it and I was like, oh my God. And I and what I loved about it was that Todd is not John Romita. Todd cannot draw like John Romita. Todd cannot draw like Joe Kubert. Mm-hmm. Todd cannot draw like John Byrne. He's not John Bishema. He can't draw like that. But he does Todd McFarlane and it's his own original thing. Yeah. And it's different than that and people like it and he's got a job in common i'm like wow then if he can do this with his own style then i can do this with my own style my style was more fashiony because i went mm-hmm. to school for fashion illustration so if you see like that cover behind you and all I, well i could always tell even back then like the way that you would design the characters and the way it was always a full the covers were gorgeous mm-hmm. like anybody that was collecting comics back then like yeah and I, loved, and I, and I, yeah, and I, I loved doing all the fashion gestures i had learned and things like that and, and like, you know, and I mean, gorgeous, like classical gorgeous, not like what was happening at the time with overexposed, you know, boobage and, yeah, and yeah. things like that, that was happening everywhere at image. Right. I meant like, yeah. uh, she was a gorgeous woman and she looked like a, like a classical style was influenced. Yeah. She didn't have, it. I mean, if you, you know, she doesn't have, you know, she's got like a 34 B, you know, cause I remember <laughs> with my wife and she's like, well, what is she? What's her measurements? You have to know all this. I'm like, yeah, you're right. You got a smart but wife, she's yeah. Like five, six. She's like five six, maybe five seven, because I draw her larger. People are like, I thought she was five nine. I'm like, nah, she's supposed to be like. I, originally, I thought she was. I figured her to be five five, but nah, maybe make her five six. She's five foot six, uh, thirty four B. You know, nothing, nothing major. And um, oh yeah, because this was the time with these giant, and not oh, yeah. breasts like Lady Death had. You know, they were like <laughs> like you know, real silicone injected basketballs. And, and of course, you know, after she came out, Lady Death, uh, after Lady Death first, Lady Death came out, then she, then Vampirella. Then, of course, they monikered the bad girls because these books really good, gave a nice shot in the arm to comics. And um, and they uh, the, 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 it, it, there was a, a slew of imitators called the bad girls then, you know, the whole bad girl movement. Mm-hmm. And you had, you know, there was a she rip off, a Lady Death rip off, Vampirella rip off some multiples of them. Well, I think everybody was trying to cash in on that ride, yeah. right? Yeah. Everybody yeah. was trying to do their own independent book, and yeah. we and kind of like the way image titles were that everybody tried to mimic those first seven. Mm-hmm. They started mimicking the independent books that were doing so well. Yeah, and we were, yeah, like I said, we were kicking ass. But getting back to 1993, so I go to San Diego Comic Con. Mm-hmm. And and I go to, to 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 and I get rejected by everyone because now my style is different. But people want me to draw like Jim Lee or Todd McFarlane. I can't draw like those guys. And if I could, I wouldn't want to draw like them. So I'm like, nah. So I came back really dejected. And I had mm-hmm. the first 12 pages or 16 pages of She Way the Warrior. And then I went to a show in New York a few weeks later or something like that. And there was Everett Hartsell. As a small guy, and I'm showing my sheet page, like, wow, this is really cool. You, will you do a story for me? I have an annual coming out in January. Do you think you could do an annual real quick? And I'm like, I don't even know if I'm in the advertising for the annual. I'm like, yeah, I could do that. So I drew the 12 pages of She and Razor, which yeah. came out before She, Way of the Warrior. And that was the first appearance of She. Yep. 
and um and uh and, and then like i said the rest as they say is is uh shistery you know shistery yeah juggernaut said i thought she was taller yeah, yeah i draw them all tall <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so how was it like how was the reception like like when when doing a comic book like that mm -hmm. and having a female protagonist like obviously you know back then you've seen the shift in the comic book fans right you've yeah. seen the huge change over the last few decades how mm -hmm. there's been more women that have been reading comic books and getting into comic books and how was that like for you right because i know i've heard many stories from chris claremont about how you know, a lot of women came up to him and like, thank you, you know, thank you for Storm, thank you for Rogue, thank you for doing these characters that actually sound like women. And that's one of the things that are, I remember uh, we only had like three female comic book buyers when I worked at the comic book store in the mid-90s. That's what they would say. They were like, oh, I love this book. They loved she. Yeah, I'm so lucky, man. I mean, but we really did our research like today. I was, as we were talking, I'm, I'm working on Miss Fury. Yeah. And Miss Fury has to go into cover into Germany. But Miss Fury is her cover is that she can speak French. Marla Drake can speak French. She can't speak German, so which is in in June Tarpe Mills's story. So I have it that she can speak French and she loves Paris. So how does this undercover woman get to a German camp? And she goes under the guise of a Vichy French uh, Nazi collaborator who ran the Joy Division camp in France. And, and, and now that the Allies are streaking across France, she's chasing the Germany. Uh, so, but how do I set? So which camp could it be? So I had to find the camp that it would be and how the Allies liberated this camp on mm -hmm. August 17th, you know, 1944. Our story takes place around the 30th of, of, of August, you know, or whatever it is. Yeah, 20, 25th of August, 26th of August, 1944. These are the things I'm doing. And I had the timeline of who was there. And then I find cool things like Klaus Barbie, if you guys have ever heard of him. He was the he he was the um, uh, he was a Nazi uh, 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 SS officer who killed so many people, and he was at that camp uh, too. This particular camp I picked. So he mm -hmm. talks about, oh, do you know him? But I'm so I'm throwing in all these references and stuff, and how she has to play this off, and uh, and it's working. But it's a lot of work. It's so much research. Uh, but I think that's what happened with she is that I did so much research into Japanese history and about the women of medieval Japan. And basically the story for she, for those of you out there don't know it, that uh, the samurai were abolished um, uh, in uh, 1868, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And they were forced underground. Um, so my story is basically this shadow war that's existed between sects of types of samurai uh, since then. But now the shadow war, instead of them fighting openly in the streets or in planes, you know, of, of armies and stuff or duels one on one, this story now takes place in the modern era for the past 200 years in the shadows of the arts and of politics and of business, you know, and, and, and things like that. And basically, Anna's been raised in this family of Sohei warriors, which are the descendants of the warrior monks. Um, uh, and she's basically a soldier drafted into this war that's existed for hundreds of years. And that's the story of she. So um, I had to get all that research. So how could this happen? Oh, that's quite plausible that the samurai are now into politics and, you know, and into the theater and in cinema and all that, you know, how, how ingrained it is in, in, in Japanese pop culture is the, is the samurai mentality and the spirit of the samurai. So I think because I did all that research and I had a lot of flashbacks to history and all, I think people mm -hmm. got that. I think, and we didn't insult our reader, you know, and the same thing with the female. We had a huge female audience back then when there wasn't a lot of women, you know, girls buying comics, believe it yeah, or not. Yeah, I remember. We really did. And that's what propelled us because my books, our books weren't misogynistic, you know, we had a strong female protagonist. Again, this is a time that Wonder Woman didn't even have her own title. You know, you had what all the great work Jim Ballant was doing on Catwoman. But aside from that, you had Lady Death, She, and Vampirella. And then a host, a slew of others then came back. Again, Chris was doing amazing things with the X-Men. I love Psylocke, one of my favorite characters. I'm sure I stole some from Psylocke, you know. And Chris is a great family friend, Chris and Beth. And, 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 and yeah, that's um, awesome. Yeah, they, I, we, we love them. And, and they really took us under their wing. And Chris saw, and Chris wrote the first, to our first trade paperback. Chris wrote the forward to it, to the introduction, you know, and that was so nice, you know, yeah. so nice. And it was, 
I mean, we were really embraced in the industry. And I remember that San Diego Comic-Con 1994. Now, here, I'm at, here I am at San Diego Comic-Con 1993, waiting on these long lines, getting rejected by everybody. And then San Diego Comic-Con 1994, here we are. Brian P Polito is next to us. And we are the biggest things of the show. We got on on NBC News. They didn't cover Superman or Batman or any of this stuff or even the image guys. Uh, they covered us. You know, they, awesome. they you know, they covered us. Uh, uh, you know, they covered she and she is on E Entertainment News. They did a segment on us and they interviewed me and Debbie. And the cool thing is, too, though, is that we then got taken into like John Ramita uh, is one of my best friends, John Ramita Jr. And I met his dad through my mentor, John, John Ramita. I'm sorry, John Tartaglioni, who's a longtime Marvel art director, inker, mm -hmm. uh, artist, bullpen guy, you know, um, long time. And the Ramitas are, are like family to us. And John Ramita introduced me to all the mainstream people, you know, it's awesome. And, yeah. And these two Italian guys from Long Island, you know, and then, and Debbie, my wife, and then, you know, uh, but we got Jeff Smith. We became great friends with Jeff and Vijaya Smith and Jeff and Vijaya Smith brought us into the circle of the independents. So we became friends with Stan Sakai and, yeah. you know, and, and, and Terry Robin Moore, you know, and then, so we had this, it was weird because I, cause she became known as like a mainstream book so fast. Well, and and she had it. All the Marvel books, you know what I mean? It was crazy. She, she was crossing over yeah. with all these characters. Like, I remember every oh, month there was yeah, like somebody yeah. like, yeah. Uh, like and you know, she I and Cyblade yeah, si over at Cyber Force and all yeah, that. Yeah. And I think how that all started was, I think because the success with she and I got to know everyone is because Un, you know, especially the mainstream guys. Like I became friends with a lot of the mainstream editors, but mm -hmm. I think why they accepted me into their fold so well is that I didn't need them. I didn't need to ask them because, you know, I've gone to so many dinners and there's poor Dan DiDio there who invites us out to dinner, right? For all of us who are working on all the big books for DC say, and then half the time you get, these guys are just hammering him for more work, you know, and, 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 and out of, out of DC's, you know, we're at a convention. We're all hanging out. We have a long convention. And they're like, hey, we're all going to go to, you know, we're all going to go to the steakhouse, you know. And you just just enjoy yourself having a steak and, 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 and talking comics and having fun. And I remember just seeing him and the editors just being hammered and then in the bars afterwards for work by freelance. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I mm -hmm. remember how – and that must, be very, it must get very uncomfortable. So – um, I think why they liked me is that, oh, John Ramita is bringing me and Tucci in here. And here I am with, with my, with Debbie, you know, my wife. And we just got to become friends with them as friends, talking about the great books, talking about Miller's daredevil run, you know, never asking them for anything, never asking, oh, Hey, you know, I'd love to do something. Can I, can I, can I, can I write a book? You know, I never did that because I was so busy with my own books. So right. I, and they're still all my friends to this day, the image so, guys, you know what I mean? Like I became yeah. friends with, with Mark Silvestri became a great friend of mine and Jim Lee. And we just talked, you know, Jim Lee and I would talk history, you know what I mean? World War II and all the stuff he's into that I'm into. And, yeah. you know, so, and Chris Claremont as well. So I became, we all became friends, you know, and it was great, like real friends because, and then what just would happen, say a year later, you're hanging out in the bar and then someone's like, how can we never work together? You know, we should so, do a call. So, but then then I have to ask because my boy Trigonosis is asking. Like, Trigonosis enjoyed his work on Heroes for Hire. Yeah. Is, so is that how Heroes for Hire got started? For example, That's Jimmy Pomiati. Jimmy Pomiati is of you know is is got to be you know among my our you know he's more than a best friend. He's 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 like family. He's like a brother to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jimmy and Amanda and 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 you know with Jimmy uh, just hanging out because I hadn't done I hadn't done anything for Marvel and that was my first work for Marvel. I like remember Jimmy and Dan Buckley, who's a publisher at Marvel, another buddy of mine, Dan, just talking hockey, going to games, you know, basketball games, things like Nick games and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they did the whole, what's cool about our civil war was that Jimmy and Justin with heroes for hire were not in the initial push for the civil war. They were not in all the original books okay. that were promoted. You see all the early advertising. Our book wasn't there. And then Dan was like, how about Billy doing this book? Or Dan said, who do you think should draw this book? And Jimmy's like, we should get Billy to do, draw this. And Dan's like, that would be great. And they called me up. Hey, do you want to do Heroes from Hire? And I'm like, yeah, that would be fun. And the cool thing is that they expected that book to sell maybe twenty to 30,000 copies. 
it sold over a hundred thousand copies. It was reprinted and it was just a, a juggernaut. It was great. And, uh, and that was a fun run working with them on heroes for hire. Uh, it, and, uh, and Marvel, and that was my, my, that's my Marvel work. That was it. <laughs> Cause then I'm hanging out with the DC guys. Like, wow, I love your heroes for hire. What do you want to do? I'm like, I want to do Sergeant rock. Yes. Okay. So let, let's talk about <laughs> that like, because that's one yeah. of my favorite books that you did. Yeah, that was, well, Sergeant Sergeant rock. Rock, again, I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm a history, I'm a novel historian, I guess. And I'm a history fanatic. Okay. Um, I guess if I didn't become a comics creator, I'd be a research librarian or something. Uh, and I just love research and I love it. And I, and, and Sergeant Rock, I love the war mags. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. that's what I bought. Of course I love Miller's daredevil. I loved, um, uh, I loved anything, you know, John Romita did, you know, the Spideys and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I love war comics and, and when I got this chance to do it, I told Dan DiDio the story, Dan and I went out to lunch and I told him the story of the Japanese Americans in the 40, 442nd regimental combat team. And at the end of the story, I had him crying. He's like, let's do this. So, you know, we did Sergeant Rock, the Lost Battalion. And that book was a, it took book a year to do it. My God, it was a, it was so it was much reference. Freaking awesome though. Yeah. It's such yeah. a good book. Thank you. And we wanted to do it because I could never be Joe Kubert. Joe Kubert's my comic God. I couldn't do Joe Kubert. Um, but I wanted this to be almost like a documentary because we were dealing with the, mm -hmm. we were dealing with the, uh, with the real veterans of the battle. They were in the book. Their names are in the book as characters. So uh, we wanted to make it like a documentary type of a story. Um, and that's why there is some exposition in it. But we wanted to explain things because this was a book for people that don't read comics. And they love that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the biggest selling war comic in 35 years or something like that. It was pretty cool. Uh, and it well, was yeah, for, for anybody that hasn't read it, it is yeah. damn good. And there have been several releases. There's been uh, over, uh, there's been hardcovers and trade yeah, paperbacks. Did, and it won the Military Writer Society of America, which is the big military, the preeminent military uh, book society. I mean, you know, all the guys, you know, all the guys that write books. So all the war books and army books and military books and, and nonfiction books, they're all a part of it. And it won the gold medal for, uh, for I, I guess, uh, they don't have a graphic novel category, obviously, but for uh, you know, historical fiction, I think it was. So it won the gold medal that year, night in twenty eleven or something. Now you that wasn't. You also got nominated for an Eisner, right, for that short story? Not, yeah, I got nominated for an Eisner. Yeah, I've been I'm a four time Eisner loser. And uh, <laughs> you're like the DiCaprio of uh, comic books. Yeah, no, I did win no one for you could I could technically say I'm an Eisner Award winner because. I contributed to the one book I wish I never had to, which was the Love Is Love book. Uh, okay. My son was one of uh, one of the the kids killed in the P Pulse nightclub, and uh, he was shot like twelve times. But the way he was shot is that he was shot covering people, uh, and he Jesus. threw his body on top of people to save them, and he was shot. And um, you know, he was just a patron there, and I, I did a you know I did a, a piece for that book. So I guess you could say I am an Eisner winner. Because I'm one of the other 50 people who were part of it, but um, but yeah, we were nominated for a book, uh, the the Batman book. And here's a funny story. I'm going to tell everyone out there: uh, if you're a self-publisher or you're a creator, um, submit your own stuff to the Eisner. So if you're working for another publisher, you should take your book and you should submit it to the Eisners because you can't count on them always doing it. So I had the Eisner committee came to me after San Diego and said, "Why didn't you submit Sergeant Rock?" You would have been nominated for Sergeant oh. Rock. They would have said I would have won. Said we would have nominated you for Sergeant Rock. Why do you – but it has to be submitted. I'm like, well, I'm not the publisher. DC is the publisher. I so said, an artist oh. and a writer can yeah, submit like, their own stuff? We were just hanging out. You know, We were just, again, hanging out in a bar or something like that afterwards at one of the parties at San Diego. Yeah. And my wife hits me, and she's like, why didn't you submit? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not the publisher. You know. And so so, then, so then, then the writer and artist can do it, huh? The writer and artist can you could submit your own book if you do a book and it's published by I don't know Clockwork Press, and you have that copy of that comic or a digital copy. If you want to submit it for digital, submit your own books, submit your own submit your own stuff to the Eisner Awards. So anyway, but I digress. So uh, yeah, so that story was cool that DC did submit it, and we were nominated. Uh, uh, and it was a story called Trick for the Scarecrow, and it featured my son. Yeah. And uh, that was great. It was it was so much fun. And and uh, how's your son now? It. What? 
How old is your son now? Right, well, I got two boys. They're teenagers now. You know, yeah. that was oh, 2012? 10? 15? Yeah, it was, it was a little bit ago. I don't remember, dude. The years are getting by me. Don't get don't, old. Don't say that. <laughs> don't get old. That's get the best old. advice I've heard today. But like, <laughs> it's, it's great just being nominated, isn't it? It's all yeah, I I don't have any nominations for yeah, yeah. Nominate, I just have a shit ton dinner. of books. Yeah, you go to this big <laughs> dinner and you get to hang out with people and, you know, and the one person I miss – that I that I've yet to see, and I I'm just gonna fanboy over is is uh is Gerard Way. I love My Chemical Romance. Is like really? Oh yeah, man. I didn't see that coming. Okay. Everyone says that. Everybody says that. Yeah, I got my my wife, my kids. We've seen them in concert, and uh, I know I'd fanboy over him. Uh, and we before, have our- so before Umbrella Academy, you were a My Chemical Romance fan. Oh heck yeah, dude. Yeah, Helena. <laughs> Black Parade is the greatest album. Of the 21st century. Wow, so, that 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 is a oh, statement. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. you, oh, you you've met him and hung out with him? No, I n- I haven't met him yet. Oh, you've never met him? Okay. I've met, dude, I've met. Uh, holy cow! I could just run down a litany of people I've met and people I've been friends with in comics. Mm-hmm. And but I've met uh, Megan Fox stopped by our booth in San Diego. Nice. And, and I'm like, oh my god! Yeah, you know, she's like, I love her. You know, my wife said, like, you're <laughs> beautiful, and she was so sweet. She had two big dudes with her. It was in yeah. the morning. We were setting up in the morning, and she came walking by. Uh, that's a cool thing about San Diego is that the, the the morning stuff is so great because a lot of people go walking by door early because they get in early. You know, they'll get yeah. a oh right right or, or guest major guest badges. You know, but we're setting our booth up and you know setting up the books and everything at the table because the show starts at ten, but they open the doors at nine. So you're mm-hmm. there at eight, and you're there, and that's when you see. You know, movie stars walking by, and you know, I met Richard Dreyfus, and that's where I always see Kevin Smith always swings by. He's such a great guy. Kevin is just so awesome, and uh, he makes it. He makes a no. Uh, uh, he makes it. Uh, he makes a point of it to visit everyone that. I mean, I've been friends with him since uh, I met him when Ball Rats came out. Uh, and they did the. Uh, they had the, at San Diego Comic Con. They had a preview uh, at the at the. Was it at the? Baseball park, baseball field, I think, or something. They had a big preview in, in San Diego for Mall Rats. And I got mm-hmm. to meet him there through Jimmy Pamiati. I got to meet him through Jimmy. And uh, and he's just great. But he always, he's such a sweet guy. But, you know, you just meet all these people at the early part. But the one person I didn't meet, I've never met, was Gerard Way. And my booth <laughs> is in front of – is right in the front when you go through the middle entrance. There's, there's halls – on the main floor, there's halls A through G. Mm-hmm. I'm hall B two C one. So right near the front, right in the, in the center, great spot. And everyone walks past us. And that's where Dan and Dio will stop by, you know, Jim Lee stops by, you know, uh, Silvestri, all, all of our friends, because behind us then is DC. Then next to that is dark horse. Next to that is, is image. And, uh, so at one point I looked up and there goes Gerard Way. Had I guess going to a signing at Dark Horse or something. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god! I'm like, Dad, that was Gerard Way. <laughs> you were fanboying. I love it. Yeah, and I'm like, and I'm looking. It's like, leave him alone. I'm like, you know, I see he's right there. You know. <laughs> so then I, uh, I remember another I, time Rick Baker walked by, and and uh, Rick Baker, the great monster maker, you know, and yeah. Rick Baker just walked by and I'm sitting in my booth and I'm looking up and I'm sketching and I got, we got a big line. It's great. I'm like, oh, I gotta be right back. I gotta be right back. And I ran, I said, Crystal, my friend, Crystal, Kissel. I'm like, Kissel, come with me. And I ran and there's Rick Baker just looking at the, uh, the, um, sideshow booth. You know, he's looking at it with his wife or something. Like, Excuse me, Mr. Baker. I'm sorry to bother you, but <laughs> he's like, how does anyone know me? Yeah, you know That's me. That's awesome. You know, yeah. And I'm like, can I take a picture with you? And he's like, yeah, you know, and, and I shook his hand, took a picture with him and stuff. And then as soon as I did that, another comment. I think it, it might have been, oh, who was it? I don't know if it was Batten Lash, because I was right near his booth, or somebody else. It was another comic creator. Like it might have been um, oh, oh God, uh, why am I drawing a blank? For, okay. Uh She's Eric Powell. About- it might have been Eric Powell because his booth was right there. You mm-hmm. know, for, for, it might have been uh, Eric Powell. And he's like, "Can I take a picture?" And he's like, "Yeah." And he was so nice because here's a this- you're you're a fan of the goon. Oh yeah, God yeah, Powell. Okay, genius dude. Oh genius. yes, I, I, I love that. A blank on Eric Powell. So I met Eric through my friend Thomas Lennon and Ben Garant from Reno Nine One One. 
Uh, oh, okay, yeah. you know, I get to hang that, out. With all, it's so great that I, I, get to I love out. that. I love those shows. <laughs> I'm like dropping so many names. I'm going to need a, a shovel to pick them all up, I think. But that's so, a, you know, so that's who you I need a collab. With. You need a collaboration with Gerard Way. Dude, that's what needs to happen. I would do anything with him. Right. I, I, you know, just so well on pop XP, our show, uh, mm -hmm. you know, our crowdfunding comic show, we're going to do a, uh, a retro revisit creators point with the creators and oh, cool. Mark, Mark Silvestri, you know, visit cyber force number one, you know, individual issues, not trades and have yeah, them yeah. Go through it. And, uh, so that's my end to Gerard way. And I just, <laughs> you're going to have him go through, and I hope I don't, but I know if I'm up there, if I'm talking to him and I'll be cool, I'll try to be cool, but I know my wife's going to come up. I'm up in my studio. Here's my little studio. And I know my kids are going to come up and they're going to be, <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be stalking. Yeah, they will. They totally will. I, uh, Doing PR stuff or uh, or just going to co conventions as press, it's, it's always fun because whether I'm supposed to be somewhere or not, I always find a way in. Yeah. Um, but in, you know, through throughout the years, when when I had a podcast, when I used to write magazine articles and stuff, I've met several people, several stars. Like my my friends work in um at DreamWorks Animation. I've introduced me to several people, but I still yeah. get much like you, starstruck by some of these people, like. I remember the first time I met Chris Claremont, like I shook yeah. his hand and I would not let go of his hand. I'm sure it was the creepiest handshake he's ever had. <laughs> and I, was, I was just like, I'm so nice. I just kept smiling. I can't even remember what I said. My brother took a picture and he was like, dude, you held on to that man's hand way too long. <laughs> and I was like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, but Chris appreciates his fans though. He told Yeah, me. he does. He does. Well, you know, I met like Frazetta. Frazetta became, it's so crazy. I met, in 1994, I met no 95. 90 in 94, yeah 95. I met Frank Frazetta, Dave Stevens, and uh, Joe Kuber, and they oh, all wow. became, and they all loved me, like they all became friends of mine. It was I, crazy. It was I, just like like I became friends with them, and I'm like, oh my god, and just like talking to Dave Stevens about. 1940s music, jazz, and you know what I mean, and and act and old Hollywood and stuff like that, and talking to Frank Frazetta. Frank Frazetta loved World War II history too, and it's really favorite, yeah. Oh my God, his favorite plane was a P47 Thunderbolt. And growing up in Brooklyn, he would tell me he would see them flying overhead as they tested them and stuff. And uh, and again, Joe Kubert. I just I, but I I totally fanboyed over all of them. But you know, Frank became like a really good friend, and you know, I always treated him like super respect, but. I didn't fanboy over Frank Frazetta like I fanboyed over uh, Joe Kubert, <laughs> believe it or not, because uh, Frank wouldn't let you. You know, Frank would call me up and he's like, "Hey, Billy, it's Frank," and I'm like, "Frank who?" And he's like, "Frazetta, what the fuck's the matter with you?" <laughs> I can curse, I'm, I'm, curse, I'm sorry, but that's you're me. good. You're good. You're good. Uh, <laughs> no, I I I never got to meet Frank Frazetta, never. And 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 these three people you're talking about, sadly, they're all they're all gone now. Yeah, they're all gone. Yep. Uh, and they get to meet uh, Dave Stevens. And my, my, one of my favorite convention stories is uh, about Joe Kubert. Like, very, like, it was the very first time Wizard World was doing this VIP thing uh, where the fans got to, and it was like me coming back into comics. So I'd been out of comics for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I went with a friend of mine who bought VIP tickets. We went in. We, nobody knew what to expect, especially the creators. They had no idea. So, it was so freaking awesome, dude. I just got to sit down and chill with these people, Jim Lee. All these people I, I looked up to when I was a kid and then in high school. And even though I had taken a break from comics, they were still big superstars to me. Well, Joe Kubert is sitting there with uh, Adam Kubert and his son, Andy, right before he was doing 1602. But Joe is sitting there, and there's a guy who has this amazing sketch pad. I'm always envious of these people. And the sketch pad has, like, just different characters from the creators, right? And yeah. I'm like, oh, man, he, he was showing them to me. And he's like, yeah, this is a sketch by Jim Lee. I got him to draw Psylocke. I'm like, this is awesome. So he, get, he goes up to Joe Kubert, and he's like, Joe, Mr. Kubert, can you please draw me a quick sketch? And he's like, of course I will. Young, like He called him young man. The guy must have been like in his 60s. Wow. And he was like, well, who do you want? And he was like, how about Ghost Rider? And the look on Joe Kubert's face, it's a Ghost Rider. And he looks at Adam. He's like, who's, that? who's Ghost Rider? And he's like, you know, Dad, the guy with the flaming skull. And he was like, oh, yeah, that guy sucks. You're getting a Sergeant Rock. <laughs> so, I was like, that is the best Joe Kubert story. I, like, I, it, wasn't, it didn't even happen to me. I just saw it happen. I'm like, that, that's classic, man. <laughs> that's brilliant, bro. 
That is uh, cool. That's so awesome that you got to, you know, meet all these people you looked yeah, up to. Yeah, dinner with them and just talk, you know what I mean? And, and, and you know, having their wives become friends, you know, our wives becoming friends and stuff like that. And, you know, it's because my wife didn't give a shit about comics at all. And, oh, and, and oh. She didn't like, you know, yeah, she doesn't, <laughs> care. she doesn't care about comics. She's like, yeah. Well, it, it, it's <laughs> I took her to a, a show in New York City in 1989 or 88. And she was just like the only girl there. And she was this adorable little thing. And she, I'm sure she had her stonewashed jeans on and she probably had heels <laughs> on, she had heels. And she was just getting bumped and just, and it, the smell. And she's like, ew. And she's like, I got to go. I'm like, no, no. She's like, no, no, no. I got to go. I'm like, are you breaking up with me? <laughs> she's like, <laughs> she's like, no, I'll see you later. I'm like, I gotta go. I gotta get out of here. I'm like, all right. And then I'm like, okay, wow. And then I'm walking, see, you know, and then I can go talk to Mike Zek and, and do my thing, you know. But she was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going, I'm out of here. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, um, I never got to meet uh, Frank Frazetta. I love his stuff, though. I was a big fan of everything that he's done. It's a huge inspiration to a lot of artists. Yeah. The great, right? the greatest of all time, I think. Man. Really That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, he he. I mean, he lived a really good life, though. I mean, oh, he yeah, was. He, he he knew he was appreciated by the. Yeah. He had a huge fan following. He lived the, the life. You know, he lived the life the way he wanted to. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So how how in the world did Billy Tucci, Dynamite, Miss Fury, Miss Fury, a character I know very little about? I was telling you this right before the show. I was like, I know she was the first. Female creation, like by a female creator. Yep. First, um, comic first action hero or comic character ever published that was created by a woman. Because we don't want to say it's the first, you know, because I'm sure there was maybe, you know, you know, Mrs. Uh, McGillicuddy, you know, of uh, Peoria, Illinois, probably created a character, but it just, you know, maybe before published. that, it was never published. Yeah. So yeah, say published because you're like, my grandmother created. Well, and, and, and giving credit to somebody. Yes. Yes. Even though she changed her name, the. Tarpe, yeah, she, Tarpe, was, right? It's pretty with, smart. Pretty smart. Well, she had back then. It was it was by necessity because it was her first. Um, it was it was back then. You know, they're not going to take women seriously as artists. They didn't. Um, so she, her name was Tarpe Mills. So people mm -hmm. would know it was created by a woman. Um, and she was this this five foot two little badass. You know, um, brilliant artist, brilliant writer. Who created this comic character and they 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 launched it, didn't not expecting a lot, and it exploded. I think at one point it was in 200 newspapers at its height. It ran from 1941 to 1952. Marvel then you know, then reprinted the strips into comics mm -hmm. um and all through the 40s. And uh it it's it 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 debuted one month after Captain America, Miss Fury, and six months before Wonder Woman. Damn. And it's 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 unbelievable because you could look at her right here, and it is. I mean, come on, you look at the influence of this character, you know, and where the, you know what well, I mean. It's cat. I, you know, you know where they got Catwoman from. I mean, right. Really, well, and, and I've also you, heard, and you you probably know this. Um, a lot of people thought that like the Black Widow costume was based on Emma Peel's uh, Avengers costume, but I remember reading somewhere many years ago that. John Romita said he redesigned it after Miss Fu uh, Miss Fury, like the leather bound outfit. Mm. So. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it because, and I mean, you look, and the cool thing is, this is how progressive she was and how uh, fierce, fearless she was. I mean, this is this was this this was an image that was published in 19, in the comics in 1940. Hey, you did an homage to that image. Oh yeah, then I did a cover. Yeah, we did an homage cover. <laughs> and she was just she, like I said, she was just fearless. Um. And during the war, when Miss Fury was at its height, that then it was good because the world was living in this, you know, we may be all dead tomorrow. You know, it's yeah. wartime. So yeah. things, you know, morals had relaxed a little. Um, you know, things, you know, women were working, you know, now. Women are, you know, women are working in the factories or making their own money. You know, now they're going yeah. out on their own, you know, this sort of thing. It was like a very liberating time for women. And then when the war ended and you had, you know, 11 million men, men coming home to work, you know, what were they going to do? You know, the women then during the Truman years were pushed back into the kitchen. 
Yeah. And she though still had this fierce mentality, you know, this 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 spirit that Noah and she and then she got in big trouble that she did era one of her characters in a bikini in a very very uh you know um uh scantily clad bikini and she was dropped by dozens and dozens of papers and that was really the beginning of the end for her because she didn't want to conform. And they finally did they 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 cancel cultured her. The powers that be because you got to understand, back at the time, there was there was so many newspapers, but m the majority of them were run by you know Hearst, you know things like that. Only a few corporations ran all the major newspapers, and they basically, even though she was so popular, they wanted to get rid of her. They didn't care, and it broke her heart. And they canceled Miss Fury on her, uh, regardless of what the what the numbers were and how many letters she was getting every month. And and that was it. And then she just kind of silently went back to June Tarpe Mills, went back to doing advertising work. She lived for another 30 years and she died alone in an obscurity in 1988. Forgotten. And, uh, and that's with, with us, with myself and Maria Laura Sanapo, our artist, and with Dynamite. Um, I approached Dynamite that uh, this story has to be told and it's got to be told with all the original characters of June Tarpe Mills. And it's got to be plausible to be in the original continuity of June Tar of, of Miss Fury. And I got to meet at San Diego and this is how Kismet works with San Diego last year. Got to have dinner, have breakfast with uh, Trina Robbins who edited the Sensational Sundays, these books right here. And she is the foremost authority on Miss Fury. Um, and I got to have breakfast with, with June Tarpe Mills that afternoon. This was Friday. That afternoon, a man shows up, a very nice man with his family, with Trina Robbins, introduces me. And it's June Tarpe Mills' nephew. Oh, Bill. nice. And she's like, Billy has this story for Miss Fury and wants to do Miss Fury. And we became fast friends. We got to hang out at the Eisners that night. The next morning, Saturday morning, who's the first person I see before the show opens that comes over to our booth? is Nikki Barucci Dynamite. I'm like, Nikki, we had to do Miss Fury. You have no idea the night I had and the day I had. And he's like, let's do it. And Maria Laura Sanapo is our artist. I said, what about Maria Laura Sanapo? Because we originally were going to do it through Dynamite. Uh, Emma Kubert was supposed to draw it, but there was just real scheduling conflicts. Um, it just never got off the ground. Um, and uh, But Emma had moved on to something else. She's working on something else. So, And uh, Maria was going to be available. And I had met Maria Laura a few years, uh, to a year before at the New York Comic Con, fell in love with her art. And uh, Maria jumped in, jumped on it, and we started, we created Team Fury. And uh, it's, it's, we're firing on all cylinders. It's unbelievable. We're, it's, it's, it's great. I'm so proud of it. I think it's one of the best things I've ever written. Man, that, that, that is really awesome and, and very kismet how it all kind of happened, yeah. right? Exactly, uh, dude. When, then, yeah, it, it, there's just so much, so much things happening with this character. It's really cool. With this, now, when do, when are your stories taking place? Are, are you, are you back to the, between July and August 1944. So she's back fighting Nazi Germany. Yeah, it opens up in New York City, and then she goes to Germany. And what the story of Miss Fury, what the Joy Division is, a lot of you guys may know about. Um, I know you guys maybe know about the band Joy Division, if you guys remember them. Mm -hmm. What the Joy Division was, was in the 1940s, when World War II started, um, the German army took the – when the they started pulling the women because the, the war production really amped up when after the United States got into, war, into the war. Um, so they needed more slave labor. What they did was the Germans then started taking the Jews out of the, out of the ghettos and the, the Jewish women, and they would – take them to camps and they would get off the train and there would be a woman there and the woman would pick the women were, were, were in one, one file, single file. And if they looked a certain way, they were sent to the left, which were the work camps where they wore the pajamas and they literally worked to death and starved to death. If they looked a certain way, whom they deemed more attractive, they were sent to the right and they were sent to camp joy. And what camp joy yeah. did was took these women, they dressed them, they taught them etiquette. They they gave them makeup. They fed them, uh, and then they turned them into sex slaves for the German army, for the SS. And these women were repeatedly raped. Uh, in many ways, they were they they suffered a fate far worse than death than the work camp. 
uh, because if they showed any spirit of independence, if they got pregnant, if the Germans fell in love with them, a lot of times this happened, German soldiers fell in love with them. These women were taken out publicly in the middle of the camps and sodomized to death and stabbed, and, and, I'm sorry, and beaten to death and shown as an example. So Marla Drake is sent to Germany to capture uh, a SS colonel uh, named Prussia, who was in June Tarpe Mill's original story, uh, to bring him to justice, to, to bring him back to, to the Allies so he can be brought up on war crimes. Mm. That's the story and how she ends up going behind enemy lines. And what she does, though, is that she turns these women, she liberates about a dozen women of the Joy Division and turn and, and dresses them in, in the Black Fury costumes, the, the costumes that, you know, the, the yeah. leopard and turns them into the Black Furies and they go hunting the Nazis. Oh, that sounds so Boy, badass. Just, just, so, just yeah. your 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 love of historical yeah. like yeah, this this sounds like right up your alley, man. Dude, like it all, is the, alley. All, all the research you're doing, all the love that you've shown for history, and the fact that you can do it in this, you know, in this medium that is comics, like this is how many issues are you all in? It's well, uh, it's well, it's it's a it's now it's a hundred it's a hundred played pages of story and art. Okay. So it's it's one big thing. It was going to be five individual issues, but it's yeah, it's I remember. Page, yeah, it's a story. It's a hundred and page. It's a hundred and um, a uh, hundred page story. It's a hundred twelve page book or something like that. A hundred and eight page book. I'm not sure. A hundred six page, but it's it's a hundred pages of story and art. And I see uh, Chris M with a like S E Hinton. Yes, exactly. And he's got a shepherd there. Which is yeah. that most shepherds. We we just got our shepherd uh was diagnosed with, with osteosarcoma and we had to get her hind leg amputated. We got it early as a stage it wasn't even stage one, we don't think. And now uh she's going through chemo and all. So uh I'm doing a print. That's what I'm drawing right now, is I'm doing a print of my dog uh with sheep, and we're gonna sell that to, to raise money for the Una fund because our bills are out of control. Those fed <laughs> bills get crazy, man. I'm glad I, in, so I'm glad you're doing that, you know, for your pup, and that's yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, like, well, remember we talked, Omar. She's, you know, their family. Oh, absolutely. She's a great yeah. dog. She's super healthy. She's a fantastic dog, and she's my wife's favorite child. <laughs> I I completely understand that. I lost my dog of 17 years two years ago, and it still it yeah, still her, hurts. Yeah, her. Yep. So we're gonna yeah. do everything we can to keep her with us for uh, next couple of years. Yeah. Good. 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 Um. Is um, Vincent? Are you still in the chat? What format is this hundred and plus page yeah. book coming out in? Let me find you the link. It's a prestige format. There's um, there's uh, let's see, let's see. There, Vincent. There, Vin hardcover. Vincent knows uh, I'm a guy that loves hardcovers, and so does our uh, so do our followers. Uh, so that's why I was wondering if there's going to be different formats available of the book. Oh uh, yeah. Well, there's the, well, we're also planning. Um, let me see the copy. Hang on a second. Absolutely. I'm using this freaking. Okay, so Vincent's oh, saying there, there's a. If you could pop it in, unless someone else did. Yeah. Um, it says yeah. Uh, there's a paperback version and a hardcover version with Vincent. Yes, saying. and then we 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 are planning to do, which I'd like to do eventually, is a black and white edition because Maria's art is just amazing. I yeah, just I was... you like, bro, if you don't mind popping that in. I do not. Um. I'm a I'm a fan. I was looking at her artwork. And I just put the link in the chat for anybody who so wants anybody to go here. To go to it. And again, you know, we appreciate this. Everyone at Dynamite is working so hard. I'm just a writer on it. Um, but uh, everybody on Team Fury, you know, is just so devoted to this. Uh, to, and, and we just hope that you'll uh, – let me just click it, grab this. Hang on. Uh, that if you can't uh, pledge, please uh, share it. Share the link if you wouldn't mind. Uh, this is we're just so proud of this book, and I think it's a story that has to be told. Yeah, I was it, looking at uh, dynamite, bro. Uh, no her, her, her artwork is gorgeous, and you're supplying covers too, right? Yes, I'm supplying like covers, and I just I just sent you another link to my she campaign, which is ending soon. We start fulfilling next week. So I'm pretty psyched for she returned the warrior that, but, but uh, yeah. So I'm supplying covers. Uh, we've got Asha Kishna supplying a variant cover. We've got Mindy Lopkins, our designer. Ceci Dela Cruz is our colorist, and Maria Laura Sanapo is our amazing artist. Amazing. 
And I'm just so proud of it. And dude, we didn't even think about it. Someone brought it up that it's all these amazingly talented women and me. And I'm like, (laughs) you did this this to to yourself, man. (laughs) All the way back with she. This is what happened. So Ryan said it just back to your deluxe signed hardcover and the poster. Oh, thank you. Um, you. And then let's talk about this, though. This, this, uh, You're also doing a she? What is this? What are we looking at here? Yeah, we got she. She Return of the Warrior is uh, our graphic novel. Um, okay. It's the return of she for the first time in fifteen years. She's back. The comic is now fifteen years uh, progressed, so time has progressed. Anna is now a single mother raising her teenage daughter. Her warrior days are far behind her, and then it all comes back. So it's sort of a comic character grows up. And our campaign is uh, we're coming on the last weeks of it. It's in demand now. And uh, if I check it out, we just crossed one hundred eighty thousand dollars on the campaign. Um, yeah, that's what's up. I just want to thank everyone who did. Uh, and I love the idea of having a mature comic character because I've been with my wife thirty years, and she's never looked more beautiful. Congratulations! Wow! You know, wow! Never looked more beautiful. Not we haven't been married for thirty years. We met college, but, but she's still, never, she's never looked more beautiful. I'm like, why not have? Why does every character have to be 22 years old and this, you know, life thing? Why not make her a beautiful, strong, mature woman? And that's what we've done to she and the fans have have really responded incredibly. I got my writing partner, Stephen Peros, who's basically the writer on it because he's just so good. He's a screenwriter mm. and uh, he's writing it. I'm just kind of I'm writing it with him now. It starts the other way, and and uh, but we've got an amazing <laughs> team. I've got uh, you know I'm doing the pencils. Our, my finisher is Gardenio Lima, who's unbelievable, and he just takes my level art to the next level. I call it a finisher because we're not using inks on this book. Uh, we're doing uh, finished yeah. pencils because oh. I, I, yeah, I've done that with she a lot. Like really since '95, I haven't really inked she mm-hmm. uh, because I love how the water how how the pencils to color. Uh, has a me too. real nice oh, watercolor. Me, me too. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that. Yeah, I and love that. even that if you look at the Sheev Amparella behind us, there's no inks on that. I love that. I just love that. It gives a softness to it. And, you know, Gardenia's you know, like, I, you know, am I inking this? I'm like, no, I want you to pencil this. Uh, oh, dude, that that's gonna look gorgeous. I love the transition in colors when it when it does that, like when you have it just on pencils and not black bold inks, right? Yeah, it looks wonderful. Um, now. The important question, Billy. Yes. Because a guy like me, obviously, um, I love collected editions. She hasn't had a lot of love in the collected editions department. Like it's been quite a long time since I've seen you guys had like a definitive. What was it? It was like a yeah, trade a paper back edition. Defi- yeah, the giant definitive. Um, and yeah. That was, and that was the last book. I one of the last books Quebec Corps did, because they ended printing it on newsprint. And it was it was terrible. Oh my god, it was just terrible. Uh, and then they went out of business. I guess they were just trying to run up paper or something because it wasn't supposed to be like that. It was supposed to be really nice black and white art, and they did. They, they, it was terrible. That was the last one we did. But we've had I've had several trades. I have Shi Jun Yen is in trade paperback. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did all the way the Warrior Story. Senryaku was a hardcover. But yep. again, when I stopped doing Shi. Uh, I stopped it 15 years ago, so there hasn't been any new she books really since in 15 years or so. Well, let's get people, let's get people caught up, man. Let's get some big big editions out there for people. Well, we are, that's, well, yep, that's what we're doing. Our next book. Oh, okay. Our, yeah, we, we have a secret campaign, a very special uh, crowd for, uh, Indigo campaign in in November, uh, end of October, and then we're going to launch come f- next February. Will be the 25th anniversary. Senryaku Writer and Artist Edition. And what that's going to be is that is Gary Cohn wrote it, and that book featured art by the biggest names in comics. I mean, that, that's when we had a Frazetta cover. So I've got art. Oh, oh my God, here's an Adam. Oh, if you've got it, let's see it. Yeah, so, I, so what we're going to do is we're going to showcase, we're going to reprint it in its original form, but okay. we're also going to showcase all the original art. So here's Adam Hughes. Oh, that's gorgeous. And it, so it'll be reprinted. With the art all on its own, you know, you know what I'm saying, like, like mm-hmm. the, you know, a, a double page spread or a one big print. It's oversized of the art, 
and then we'll have the, the company text on, on the other side. But I want to show the art if it's black and white in its original black and white form. No, absolutely. So, I, and, I, and, I, and, and then we will also do that. We will have a, a Senri original Senriaku 25th anniversary um, uh, you know, graphic novel of the same one. And then next year we will be doing the She, Way of the Warrior, yeah. Homo, Homo A, uh, a um, an omnibus of it. Full color omnibus of it, too. Oh, be oh, 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 you had me at omnibus. Yeah, yeah, full you color. Said, you said the magic word, sir. Yeah, full color. We're going to do soft cover to keep the cost down and full color. But we're all going to do those all Indiegogo first, and then they'll be in, di and they'll be in diamond uh, in, in 2021. Here, 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 here's just a small suggestion, Billy. Yes. And yeah, just just a suggestion as a guy as a collector, there are fans that are willing to pay the extra price for a hardcover if you want to take that the Indiegogo way. Like instead of doing, you know, you definitely, you know, do do what you need to do to get that out because these books were great. They were a big part of my growing up. Like one of the things I hated about leaving comics were, were independent books like this. Um, but there are fans that will pay the extra price for a hardcover, even if it's limited edition, just, just throwing that at you. Oh, okay. Yeah. I want to keep them all limited because what people don't realize is that, you know, even with the new she book that's out, or even with, let's talk Miss Fury. Okay. So the Miss Fury. Comic that comes word. Out, <laughs> yeah. Now, Miss Fury, it's an oversight. It's a trade paperback and it's a hardcover mm -hmm. edition, but you got to think right now, we've just crossed a thousand backers on Miss Fury and thank each and every one of you, but you've got to see, You've got to you you've got to know that when you go through Diamond and do the trades, mm -hmm. you're selling ten thousand copies. These are all very limited. I mean, with the hardcover, maybe five hundred copies only. The hardcover edition of Miss Fury Joy Division, you know, the the, yeah. the soft covers. There's maybe only if there's three covers, there may be only three four hundred of each or five hundred each of each top. So these are all, you know, um, uh, very very limited print runs. All of them. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then they, the, and because then they're gonna, they, they'll break them down. I think they're gonna plan on selling them in floppies and stuff later on. I'm, I'm glad you're bringing it back. I know I'm not a publisher, so I'm just a writer, yeah. author, so I don't know. So yeah. I'm like, I got I think, problems publishing my own. Book. <laughs> I think it's wonderful you're bringing it back to, to you know, get. Old, new readers back to reading it. Old readers that didn't keep their single issues mm -hmm. back to enjoying these stories again. I think it's a wonderful way to keep that going. Uh, what kind of now that we you know we talked about your work, how you got started? What kind of like what kind of advice do you give people? Like there, I know there's a couple uh, uh, artists here, like my my good friend of mine, Matthew Mayhe, who who would love to work in the industry. Like what kind of advice do you have? for people trying to break it into comics, whether they're just trying to start their own or whether it's like, you know, breaking it into one of the big publishers. Yeah. Don't worry about breaking into the big publishers, doing your own book, do your own book. Look at Ethan Van Skyver just crossed over a million dollars the other night on cyber fraud. Now, not at, on for, for a 48 page comic. Now, not everyone's doing that. Obviously he's the only one doing it, but, the cool thing is, is that there's never been a better time than to do to to do your own creator own comics. Never. So, do your own book. Tell your own story. If you don't feel that you are up to the task to write it, get someone to write it with you. Share ownership with them. Create a project together. Put that book out and get get yourself out there on social media. Have a YouTube channel. Have a Instagram account and post a panel of your art every day or sketches create your own characters and then launch an indiegogo but as a digital edition get those followings combine it as a digital graphic novel so because the most expensive things when you do a crowdfunded campaign mm -hmm. is is to print it and to pack it and ship it that's the most expensive part um if you do a digital edition then you could send people pdfs of it of okay. the book. And they have a digital only edition because there's already an Eisner award for a web comic or edition or, or a digital edition. Do it as a web comic, do it, do it as a digital edition. Cause once you're done with that digital edition, then you can go and then you can go and have another follow-up Kickstarter or Indiegogo and launch it as a printed copy. And all those people that supported you, if it's a hundred people, they'll all buy your book. But now you could say your book is done. They're going to want that copy. They're going to want that floppy, if it's small, if it's 32 pages, they're going to want it. If it's 50 pages, they're going to want it. If it's a 100-page book or an 80-page book, they're going to want it. 
and then you do it like that. Build your own empire. Be the next Robert Kirkman. Man, Don't that guy. Marvel in DC, because let me tell you something about Marvel in DC. All right, is that when the industry closes down after two weeks of 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 uh, quarantine or of a government, uh, you know, of the shutdown, Marvel and DC, these companies that have made together close to a billion dollars last year. This is the publishing aspects of it. They deem their creator so lowly and so insignificant that they gave the orders to the vast majority of them to put their pencils down and stop working and furloughing them. So if you rely on Marvel and DC, I wouldn't. That's all I'm going to say. I loved working for them. I had a lot of fun with it. It's not the editors. You know, it's not the editors and it's not the creatives. It's the upper, upper echelons, the ones above the publishers and stuff like that. It's the powers that be. And those guys are the ones that are that that yeah, with, with someone who's drawing a comic making two hundred dollars a page, you know what I mean? You can't yeah. afford, afford to pay someone four hundred four thousand dollars. You and that's and they do have the money. They just that's how little how small they they view their creators. Do your own book. That's my advice. Um. So you've done you you're suggesting uh doing digitally so matthew's asking what about comicsology self-publishing I'm, I'm not on comicsology uh we had one of the one of one of the one of the, the one of the uh officers of comicsology one of the big shots of it one of the and uh, on our show and he's like send it to me so i'm going to do comicsology too but the thing is matthew do your own book first do your own book get it out there digitally raise your own money raise funds to your friends your family your social media, uh, raise your own book, publish your own comic first, even if it's digitally, and then bring it to Comicsology. And show them, here, this book's done. Here you go. We already yeah. have a built-in audience for it. That's just what I would do. No, that's some good advice. Some good advice. Things are a lot different now than they were when you were trying to break it into comics, right? Yeah. You, yeah. Were, you were mailing stuff in. Oh, yeah. Getting rejections and that's yep. heartbreaking. Yes, First of all, nobody really understands how much postage is on those big ass pieces of paper that you're mailing in. And then what you do is you say, you well, you send in the Xerox copies. So you have to send them in. You want to send them eleven by seventeen so they can look at it and see your page. You know, as big as it is. But then you have to send it like priority mail or even overnight it because that's what they tell you is that it comes to your desk and you know they're used to getting small envelopes. Something comes in from FedEx to an editor. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's this? They're gonna open it up and look at it, and that and and that's what makes it even worse when you get rejected. Because <laughs> they took their time looking at it. Yeah, I think no DC didn't DC manual did DC didn't have the pencil down uh, policy. I know Marvel did, so forgive me if DC didn't. Um, I I really I know that well. I IDW did, uh, Boom did, Valiant did. Valiant did. I, I don't know if it was pencils down at Marvel or DC. It was just trying to reschedule things and trying to decide whether to go oh, digital. Did. I know Marvel gave the pencils down. I know that. Oh, they did? Okay. Oh, yeah. I know they were trying to figure out how to do this with the monthly issues, like whether they should go digitally or whether they should go physical or wait for physical for the comic stores. They shouldn't, they shouldn't have done that. They had the but, money. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a weird time. I mean, the comic yeah. book stores were, were hurting. So, yep. Uh, this is. Are you open to doing a private commission right now? Oh, uh, how do I say AA Ron? <laughs> <laughs> Love that. A -A -Ron. A fan of Key and Peel, yeah, man. man. That's great. Uh, if you do me a favor, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. If you send me a, a, a direct message, um, I'll get back to you. I'm a little behind right now, uh, just because of the campaign. So, I'm not taking on any until the end of the summer when I finish up. But, um, yeah, send me a message. I'd, be, I'd love to do one for you. I just gotta, I just gotta get done with what I'm doing now. So yeah. So he's doing a lot of research right now on yeah, that. Uh, so crazy. I'm, Miss like, Fury. I gotta tap out how Miss Fury can sneak from the Ritz Hotel where she's hanging out with someone who may or may not be Ernest Hemingway, all the way through the streets of Paris via rooftop, and then along the Seine River so she can get to the museum to meet her contact. Ooh, you're, you're speaking my language. You've said Omnibus and Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway. Now that that's what's up. <laughs> Dude, I'm a Hemingway nut, man. I'm a Hemingway oh, nut. I, I, we, went, we went to Spain. We went to Key West. And every time my wife's like, where are we going? And I'm like, you know damn well where we're going to go because we're in Key West. 
We're gonna go to the man's house. Hell we're yeah. in, we're we were we were in Spain, and I'm uh, and we made a special trip just to go to the bars that he would go to. Nice. Just that Ooh, one day. Hemingway. Let's do a show and talk Hemingway, man. Oh, I'd love to. Uh, Maybe when Miss Fury comes out, because I'm not saying he's in. There's a there's a contact who may or may not have taken over the Ritz Hotel on August 25th, okay. 1944, and his okay. is Papa. So, <laughs> oh man, yeah, that sounds awesome. And by the way, yeah, I was uh, looking while we were talking at uh, all these pictures from the inside of Miss Fury. This looks really awesome. It looks, like looks like a great book. I can't wait to. I'll be doing an overview of it. I'm sure on my channel because it looks gorgeous. I appreciate that. And then we'll talk Hemingway, buddy. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, that, one of the things somebody was mentioning, I think it was Robert here about you. You seem like you're really approachable and like a nice guy. But I will say this. Anytime I've been to a con and talked to Billy, he's been great. This is the same way that he acts at a convention. Like he's just really down to earth and uh, really uh, enthusiastic about whatever he's working on. Well, dude, you know what? I uh, If you can't have fun in comics, making comics or being in the comics industry, I don't know where, where you can have fun at, you know? Maybe Gerard Way is a rock star. <laughs> I think so. I think comics in uh, you know that's as that's as close as uh, rock stardom almost, right? Yeah, I don't know about that. Ma maybe not the fan base <laughs> or the money. <laughs> maybe not the money. Maybe if you're Todd McFarlane or yeah, Rob Liefeld, you know nowadays made you know millions on Cyberfrog. You know, yeah, Robert Kirkman. Well, Kirk Kirkman. I mean, he did. He he found that image. He, he did right by what Image was doing back in – using the Image formula of the 90s, the way that it started. He did it properly and used it to just freaking, you know, build his empire. He lived here. I've had him in my – in this very basement, I had him over – like, I had him. Uh, he came over. We did an interview when I had a podcast. That was probably 13 years ago. Now he's all Hollywood. Like, he moved out of Kentucky. Good for him. Yeah, he's, he's a great living guy, in California. He's a great, great Funny guy. dude. He's yeah, a funny he's a dude. I really guy. enjoyed him. That's just cool. There's, you know, there are – as in every industry, you have your dickheads, you know, but oh, for the yeah. most part, there's a, a lot of – you know, there's a lot of really cool people, and they get it. They know that you guys, like the fans, changed our lives. You know, like if it yeah. wasn't fans, I'd be painting bridges for a living, you know, right now, you know, uh, that's what I'd be doing. So I'm so happy, you know, thank God for the fans, you know, I mean, they changed my life. So how can you not show them that appreciation? And the cool thing is what gets me is that someone brings me a book that I did, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And they asked me and they asked me to sign it and then I sign it and then they say, thank you. And I'm like, no, 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 dude, thank you. You put food on my table. You know? Yeah, that's that that's what's up, man. And and I think that's the attitude most creators should have, but unfortunately, you know, not everybody's like that. Just no, like, like you said. there's big heads everywhere. Yeah. And you call them out on it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So um Billy, that's thank cool, you guys. thank you so much for joining uh me today. It's been a it's been a lot of fun. Uh, everybody, check out those links. I'll put it also in the description for uh Miss Fury and the She Book. Um and after Miss Fury, what any any anything else you're gonna be working on? You're gonna go yeah, back to if, focusing on she, or what else yeah, are you gonna if I, do? If I may, um, you know, again, I'm just writing Miss Fury, so it's that's the easy part. I got the easy job. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so right now we're working on She Hotaru. Uh, she Return of the Warrior is still in demand, but uh, the hardcover to today, uh, the our two black and white editions are at one's going one went to the printer last week, our rough cut edition. Our pure line edition goes to the printer today in not next week, but the week after our hardcover and our color editions of the graphic novel go to press. Nice. So we'll be fulfilling she way of the war, a return of the warrior all through July into August. In the meantime, I, Stephen Peros and I are working on she Hotaro now. She Hotaro launches in, uh, on Indiegogo in August. Uh, that'll be shipped in October. And then in November, we have our my secret she mega crossover comic that's launching on Indiegogo at, in November. So that's all right. Next year awesome. we do our on the bus edition. Um, uh, Zombie Sama comes out next year. Uh, I got a, a big secret project with a couple of superstar creators uh, that comes out next year. And I did a Wonder Woman story, so I don't know if that's coming out this year. I think Christmas time it's coming out. Okay, uh, with Frank Thierry. So uh it's oh, I like that guy a lot like too. It. Yeah, I did. I'm I'm busy all the way into into 2022 now. 
which is cool. I'm actually six months behind where I should be. And Miss Fury, we're going to have a follow up Miss Fury after Miss Fury Joy Division comes Miss Fury of the Black Furies. Then after Miss Fury of the Black Furies, Maria's already contracted into doing the next two graphic novels. Nice, uh, nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Joy Division launches in February for the 80th anniversary of Miss Fury. Um, then the Black Furies comes, I guess that's in the spring. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Miss Fury Hollywood Nights comes out in the summer. Awesome, man. You got out. You, you, you do have a schedule. You know, maybe you can sneak in some uh, Sergeant Rock in there again. Ooh, I got a plan for that. I got a plan. Okay, my man. Yes, that lost that, that lost battalion was freaking awesome, and yeah, I, I got a strongly... big plan for that. I just I've been talking to DC about it, so knock on wood, we'll see. <laughs> okay, and then uh, I got to come back on if if you don't mind, Omar, because we's pals. Oh yeah, yeah, man. You're you're welcome on. Thank you everybody for watching. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, you, check out our sponsor, cheapgraphicnovels.com. Don't forget to hit those links to check out uh Billy's Indiegogo and that Miss Fury that looks freaking amazing. Thank and you. And remember, peace, love, fury strong. Nice. Nice. <laughs>